Um, and so we took a we took a different strategy to reinvent the band at, at FM American Radio, which is a, a format called Active Rock, which is basically disturbed, God smack, hailstorm. It's what that if you think of that format, that's what that is. And so in the late nineties, uh, there was what 130 some stations that played that format. Now there's maybe 30, and probably shrinking every day. Um, you were probably on that format at yeah. some point, and. Um, so we chose to take a different management route, and, they, and it was great. Cryptic Writings, we, we had found on making that record, we decided, we had come to a conclusion that we needed a, a third, a third, a third. A third needed to be metal, a third needed to be radio hits, and a third could be kind of whatever we wanted in the middle. And it was successful, and people, you guys, people bought it, and it's a work. Well, as we went into the Risk album, we kind of got caught up in the, well, if some is good, more must be better, right? Uh, so why not make more radio hits? Right? And of course, we completely missed the mark. We went in the studio, not prepared, did not have the radio hits, did not have the metal songs, and really just fell short. And uh, we had no hits and no and no metal exactly. And his management said, um, it's Jason's thing. He said, if this works, David name is a genius, and if it fails, I'm an asshole. And of course, he got all the blame, got shoved out, was berated and whipped and lashed. You know, probably still to this day. Um, but the truth of it is, is it was it, we we all signed off on it, um, and everybody's names are on the album, so everybody knows who did what, and there's no backing out because, you know, when you're ready to take all the glory, you put my name all over it. Now, oh, it wasn't yeah. called a risk for nothing. The music industry salute, therefore, right? <laughs> so, um, but that that's you know, very, speaking to your point, you know, so we've had records like that in the Megadeth catalog. Virtually, we're kind of like a mutual fund. The better ones have survived better than the weaker ones, so it kind of balanced out. Um, but uh, and some bands not so not so lucky. Um, a lot of groups, uh, you know, again having a label ourselves, you know, uh, there's that thing where you know sometimes records would get made and labels would just shelf the record that would never come out for whatever reason. And obviously, the MP, we try not to do that. We don't do that. But um, you know, to have to see bands that have made incredible records. Um, that for whatever reason they have, you know, a success and then the next one just goes away. Yeah. There's a lot of things that come out with that. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, you know, again, Megadeth, we were at, you know, what, uh, just doing our thing, going platinum, double platinum, and out of nowhere, like Nirvana shows up, you know, and when Seattle showed up and I think, yeah. you know, changed the course for most of us. I don't know if you know this, but Love is on the Way was the last ballad. So I actually technically killed hair metal, thereby giving Nirvana a career and paving the way for Soundgarden. I'm a grandfather of grunge, if you didn't know that. Leo, you royals. You're welcome. <laughs> but the funny thing is, though, if you've ever heard the rest of the record that Love is on the Way is on, it's the coolest, heaviest, grungiest record you've ever heard in your life. Their label just went, hey, let's release this fucking ballad. <laughs> It's funny because what actually happened is we went to Mexico with the guy who shot Gift, the movie for James Addiction. Yeah. So we're doing this whole voodoo, like, Santa Rita. So it's basically just a heroin documentary, by the way. Video, and we got a call that some station in South Florida started playing the battle. So I got a call from Doug Morris, who's like a legendary guy. He's like, I know you guys are all into this being cool stuff, but I really don't give a shit. You have a hit. Yeah, so sell it. Maybe you go for it, or thanks for coming. So that kind of changed the course. I mean, yeah. and when you have a hit record or you have something successful, still to this day, even online, you know, and with your, it doesn't matter what you're doing, something like takes root or has a, a grab, it just took on a life of its own. It's like, it's not, I'd like to say my genius of the label brain created success for skin you know, but The truth is, like, that music touched people in a certain way and it just starts to spread. Maybe not the way it used to in the heyday, but a real record, a real great record will set you free. So what was supposed to be the single? What did you guys want as the single from The Lizard? We were filming a video for Hostile Youth. Wow. Imagine how different that might have gone if you'd actually done that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, Willie Nelson is quoted as saying, none of us here have a problem that a hit record wouldn't cure. <laughs> or that great. goes for every one of us in the room. Yeah, or, or create. Or create. So, <laughs> so, so Steve, so, so you've been on major labels and now you're on our label. Now, talk about, you know, what, what was it like in the, in the day and what's kind of the difference it could be on a, other than the millions and squillions of dollars and tour support and 
Here we go, there. I mean, so I'm talking about the difference between, you know, being on a label like EMP and, you know, the big, giant, multi-million dollar machine that you were in in the 80s. Well, we were on RCA Records. We signed a three-album deal with them. And uh, it's often referred to, RCA is referred to as the Rock Cemetery of America. <laughs> RCA was the Music Cemetery of America. <laughs> but uh, they didn't want us to put, turn up the radio on the album. That's how stupid they are, actually. Um, we said, hey, it's called Turn Up the Radio. I mean, what radio station is not going to want to play that? And so we recorded it anyway, and after they heard it and everything, they said, oh, okay, that'll work. And then I got the idea of, why don't we do uh, callers out to all the stations? So we spent two eight-hour days in the studio saying, turn it up, you know, WTZY or whatever. We did that just over and over and over again until we got every radio station in America, basically. And the funny thing, we did that last year for the new record, Get Off Your Ass, and we're still saying, hey, this is Steve Watergraff, turn up the radio and get off your ass. So we just, we put a twist on it. We put a twist on it. But uh, it, it ended up doing pretty well. I mean, we sold like five million, so I wasn't complaining about that. But uh, then what happened was Bob Buziak, uh, or Bob Summer, uh, actually died, uh, who was the president of RCA, and they had to bring in Bob Buziak to take over. And during that time, there was just no promotion for the second record at all, nothing. Because they got all new staff and everything. And uh, what happened was, um, you know, during that time, it, was, it wasn't it was only us, it was Mr. Mister. It was uh, the Pointer Sisters, Kenny, Kenny Rogers, the Eurythmics, uh, the they all suffered from it. And those albums didn't do anything, so. Um, it's, it's just one of those things where you know, you're relying on the record company to really put a lot behind you, and uh, they did it on that one. Actually, what helps all the second and the third album was the tours that we got on our own. So we went out touring. Of course, the first tour was, <coughs> excuse me, with Van Halen, and then we went out with Motley Crue, and I don't remember that at all. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, and Aerosmith, and that's what, you know, it's the bands you go out with and everything, and, and the, the lineup that they put together with that really helps, uh, you know, chicken sales and really helps you with yourself as well. But now we're with EMP, and they kick ass for us. So we reached, uh, with the help of Tom down here, we reached uh, uh, 21 on the, uh, uh, billboard charts for classic rock. So. But again, a great record, still a great record, and it's kind of a microcosm of how it was 10, 20, 30 years ago, but it still kind of works the same way. It's still sort of the same channels. Now, you know, it's classic rock radio, you know, and, and, which is cool. I mean, now, it's funny, I worked with Jeff Leppard and Phil Collins a few years ago, and, and he did this side project record. I'm like, hey, we're going to take it to classic rock radio and do a bunch of, and he's like, no, classic rock radio is for old people. He was like, I was like, and let that put in. I'm like, no, it's I am old, so it's okay. I know, I'm like, no, it's not. The classic rock radio has changed, and honestly, now it's kind of a cross between active rock and cool 80s metal, you know? So, again, now that, and again, we, we do a lot of stuff with Alice Cooper, his son Dash is on the label, and, you know, obviously he has nights with Alice Cooper, who has been very supportive of the Watergraph and all of our bands, and we love and thank them for that. And, but yeah, I know, look, it's the same. Still kind of the same machine, just a, a smaller, leaner version of it, you know? Well, one thing, you know, Steve, you brought up that I want to really comment. You know, the music business and what Jason said about a record that organically just gets root and takes on a life of its own. I mean, those things are a phenomenon that are just unstoppable and they're awesome. Um, and those songs often outlive the writers, outlive the artists. Um, um, but at the same time, the music business is very much a people business. Um, and I think we've probably all been through that where the person who signed us to the label leaves, they depart, the A&R person is generally the talent scout. Um, we no sooner finished the piece sells but who's buying record and our A&R guy Tim Carr had left. Tom Waller <coughs> went over to start Interscope and we were the red-headed stepchild of, of capital, you know. And I think ultimately they looked at the, at the 
bottom line and went, who's Megadeth? Who signed? Who in here signed these guys? Who are they? They're fired. Yeah, no, and they looked at it and went, did they make us money? Yeah, all right, we'll keep them. Next, Tina Turner, Steve Miller, Bob, you know what I mean? And they just go down the bottom line checklist, and that's the reality of it. Um, so if you're making people money, they keep it. And it's, it, that is that, but I think everybody who's here today is here because you're trying to make a people connection. Um, and I think, uh, I know obviously from our side with the label that we, we sign things we're passionate about musically, but there's also, there's a human connection. Um, and even on this side of it, whether you're a manager or a label, um, we probably know this now because we're a little bit older, but when we were young and a pain in the ass and difficult to work with and probably unmanageable at certain times, uh, you realize that, you know, when, again, when people are making you money, you're willing to put tolerates some BS, but at the same time, uh, it's a little bit easier and more fun to work with artists who are actually willing to get in and down in the trenches and do the work. Uh, That's it. With me, I mean, I can start doing all the work at the label. Dave just talks about it a lot. And it's awesome because it's a good team. He goes out and does interviews and talks about it. And I, you want to art it? It's true. It's true. We all know the, it. Coming. The interesting thing I've learned about running the label side is I've signed so many bands like where I've gone and met them or seen a showcase or flew wherever. And they were like these awesome hard-working, promoting machines, and they had their online presence together, and then you sign them, and they don't know how to do anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> like, they can't figure like out how to do something. You gotta change it and post something. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. used to be doing shows, we, we can't, we can't do a show anymore. Like, well, how do you do anything before I make it? <laughs> I think the, the, and then, I think, you should hear from Ron, uh, a label at its best is an amplification of what you're already doing. It's not, like a, a cure-all for like, you have no career, your songs are okay, and you're not drawing anybody. If I get signed, I'm gonna become metallic or mega. It doesn't work like that. Those were already amazing bands. And then when those systems are functioning at their best, you know, they, they, they just amplify this greatness and put it out in front of everybody. That's what a label really does. And it's now the system, system has failed. It's not a cure. Yeah. That's true though, I tell every band when we sign them, Look, we're only going to work as hard as you are. You're not going to sign our label and just say, oh, the label's going to do everything now. No, I'm going to work my ass. I'm going to work as hard as you do. If you don't do anything, you don't tour, fuck you. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm going to work as hard as you do. Getting, even, even back, you know, I got 10 bands signed to the label for two years. You know, and even back then, I told my bands, look, getting signed isn't the end game. That's the fucking beginning. When you got, even then, when you got signed to a label, you got the big deal. You were starting, man. That was the beginning. Just like corn. I mean, look, they got signed and they started, man. You don't know it. You're, you're just starting. You get signed, and that's when the real work starts. You basically start over. It's like a video game, like a new level. It's a higher level. It's way harder, but you know. Can I take the floor? Yeah. Don't fucking do it. That's it. Oh, that was it. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, definitely, as, as David was saying, it is a, it's a people thing. It's about relationships. Everything in life is about relationships, whatever it is. So here's what I always tell people that I have learned. If someone's going to do the right thing, they're going to do it whether it's a contract or not. If someone's going to fuck you in the ass, they're going to do it whether it's a contract or not. Know who you're getting in bed with. And don't say, oh, well, you know, the guy you know, I've seen him screw a lot of people and everyone's warning me not to work with him. But he could possibly do this and this and this, and he said that we'll do this and this and this. Set yourself up. It's the kind of people that you work with. You want to surround yourself with good people, whatever they're doing, and whatever that is in your life, really. And if this is going to be your life, it's very important that you pick the right people. Damn, it got so quiet. So what are you doing here? So what are you doing here with us then, Ron? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. It feels like a funnel full of all shit that I just gotta get through one mouth. Um, yeah, I have run labels. I have been on the tiniest of labels. I have been on the biggest of labels. I've been on mid-sized labels. I've got you know, into the umbrella of a bigger label, all that stuff. I've had the pleasure of working with these guys on the last record. Uh, you realize one thing for sure, it's personal and you want to have a good relationship with these people. They have to be the kind of people you want to have a relationship with. And they have to feel the same way about you. And it is teamwork. 
Just because you're on the label doesn't mean that your responsibilities are over. No, now is the time that you gotta ramp it up and you have to start working together as a team and say, okay, I have this, I have this. How can we put it together and make something even greater than, than just the two of us separately? That's the kind of stuff you gotta figure out. And you have to be very creative the way you work with your music. You have to be the same way with how you can get people to hear your music. No, it's interesting. There was every body that I worked with that was in some like a huge, huge selling band, they always told me that in the beginning, it was almost like there was some kind of trick that they pulled off in order to get out there and get known and to, to be noticed and to be that one grain of sand on the beach that I was like, oh wait, what's that? I remember uh, in Art of Anarchy, that was a band that our first single was Scott Wyland and our next single was Scott Stapp. Uh, Stapp was telling me how in the beginning with Creed, they, I should probably say this for the, the marketing and promo thing. Uh, but, but I'll just say real quick, because we were talking about managers and, and labels, and they're all intertwined. So this, everything we're going to be talking about any time today all meshes together as part of one big thing. Uh, he was saying that they couldn't get on the radio. Imagine that Creed could not get on the radio. Nobody would play them. So what the manager did is he bought radio ads that were three minutes long that were the song and put them on at prime time. That was the trick. Limp well, Bizkit did the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there was another band I know from, from the 80s that made uh, a fake record label and made a fake live album and just started passing it around, like, hey, do you hear about this? This is like the hottest new thing, just, you know, the best kept secret kind of thing that happens word of mouth. Uh, and then from there, everyone's talking about it. Who is this band? You know, they sound amazing live. That's so, you know, on this little indie label. It was, you know, really cool to be on some little indie label. And from there, suddenly they got signed to the, the big one, who, are, if I'm not mistaken from what you told me, uh, was actually instrumental in, in making this big label and putting all this together. The trick. Uh, sometimes it takes some kind of trick. You have to be as creative as you are when you're, you're banging your head against the wall, write a song, and come up with that amazing thing that eventually just comes out. You gotta be the same way with everything relating to that song. The song is the smallest part of it. It's the whole world around it that you have to really tackle. Uh, yeah, so let me show up now. Uh, the funny thing is to that, the, the first Linkin Park record, when they signed to Warner Brothers and Jeff Blue was there and our band kind of put the whole thing together, I ran a company called Loudside and we were kind of a big marketing company. They came to us and said, we want to start, we want you to make up the Loudside label to put out an independent EP for Linkin Park, to, for Linkin Park to build Street Cred before Hybrid Theory comes out. We didn't end up doing it and they did okay, but... It's, you know, that was one of the things they did. Though it's really sure. important then to you know do that sure. indie thing and have street cred before you know you don't look like a band that was just put together and put out and just blew up. You know it had to build organically, and now everything's backwards. Now you just build organically. Yeah. Well, I think the biggest thing we're fighting is you guys are fighting. I mean, at least back in my day, it was a little, a little bit. I think there's difficulties all the time. It was never easy, but is that generally nobody gives a shit. Like, nobody cares that you're in a band, nobody cares about your sampler, nobody can't, it, 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 it takes so long to break that wall down. And maybe that's because everybody in the world is on Instagram and like, here's me making waffles. Like, when we, I was talking about to, to Max about, you know, The Blizzard of Oz being the first record I bought. And like, there was such a, there was such a distance and that was such a magical, like, Ozzy's coming to Florida? Like, it's insane. Like, you, but you never saw it. It was like once a year you'd see a magazine. Now I can watch the guy do his laundry 24 7. And <laughs> so there's so much noise. And everybody's got a song. And everybody's got something on iTunes. And there's 8 billion tracks on Spotify. So it's your perseverance and just keep telling your story and, and connecting with people that care and, and build it from that. It's just that, that, I think, from a label perspective, is like I'm one of 10 million people calling the radio station going, Hey, have you heard this band on pit? You know, no one cares. You know what a lot of it is too? Is if it's working, keep doing it. And if it's not, change. You know, we were talking last night in the car about Greta Van Fleet. And those of us who are a little older who grew up on Led Zeppelin, obviously there's an opinion about them, right? But there's a very young generation who did not grow up on Led Zeppelin. 
It's like I shared replay music yesterday. I did not grow up on the Beatles. They were broken up and done by the time I stayed broke in, what, 71? By the time I started hearing music, it was 74. They were done. It wasn't even on my radar. There's young people hearing Greta Van Fleet loving this Led Zeppelin sound, and it's their generation. It's their music. Nirvana was the same thing. They were basically Beatles. They were little three-minute Beatles songs. Just very harshly sung, but they resonated to that. And really, that's what music is. Music is a backdrop of a generation. And that's really even what Guns N' Roses was. I remember when that Guns record came out. I mean, it was a it was a statement about an entire generation. And when we talk about Lincoln Park, Corn is the same thing. When Corn came out, they I watched them. There was there was our crowd, right? And we spread our feet and we had banged. And Corn had big baggy pants and they did this thing, right? <laughs> and it was just it, everything about it, the way they moved, the way that their hair grew, everything about it was it was a voice of a generation. I was at um, some, uh, you know, just around a, a young collective of people at that time. And I, could, and I remember that when I heard a young girl, she had like black fingernail polish and, you know, bolts and tattoos and stuff around her in her face. And, and she looked over at her girlfriend and goes, are you ready? And quoted that opening line of Jonathan Davis on that song. And I looked and I went, there it is. This band is, is connecting. And this was in Phoenix, Arizona, just with a couple of little meth heads, you know, a couple of meth heads. This band is awesome. And, uh, whatever, meth heads need a backdrop too, you know, so uh, awesome, Brian. But, uh, but that, and that's a lot of it. That, that really is a lot of what it is, is it's just having a connection. So sometimes people are sort of, oh, I'm learning from my art, bro, and I'm all about my songs. Like, well, you're already fucking selling shit, so do something different, you know. And we've all been told that. As I sat and listened to Max this morning, I was getting PTSD hearing the stories of making Countdown to Extinction. Because as brilliant as that album was, it was not an easy album to make. There were times it wasn't fun, it was painful, and I mean, you know, Max's job as a producer was to dig down into our soul and find things we didn't even know we were there and bring out some very uncomfortable moments, personally and collectively as a group, and get that on tape because that's the story. That was taking Megadeth where we had never gone before. And that was really uncomfortable because, you know, fortunately we were still kind of poor and we didn't have mortgages and things that had to support by our money, which we've all probably fallen into those traps of, you know, wow, I can afford a nice car. Holy shit, my next record's stiff. How am I going to pay for my nice car? You know, those are next level problems, you know, that we, if we're fortunate enough to have. But, you know, really digging down in and find, getting to that to that place. And, you know, we can hand a lot of CDs, you know, and every once in a while one comes along and you go, holy cow, man, that, if these guys, they've got something here. And it's really cool. So, again, I just, you know, encourage everybody here, all of us too, you know, that if it's working, awesome, keep doing it. But if it's not, you know, look for something different and look for outside help. Call people, get with people, you know, and, and that's part of what we're doing here today is, is connect with people so that when you walk away from here, you're not just walking on solo. It's a we deal, not an I deal, you know. So we're, we're in it together as a, as a music collective, as artists and, and, and people that make these records. So definitely tap into that, you know, and you, use the resources. A big thing, I, I was lucky enough to work with Ahmed Ergen while he was still in Atlanta for a bit and Jason Flom, who signed for that fleet. And one of the big pieces of advice he told me when I was starting the label side of it was like, you can always tell if it's real. He goes, I can go to any place on the, in the world and go watch some band showcase in front of 50 people. And I, if I see 50 people there, like I know it's their mom, the three people they work with, and no one cares. You go to a place and show me a band drawing 500 or 1,000 people, and I know something's happening. And that's how we found Nonpoint. You know, when I went and saw those guys initially, they were drawing a thousand people to these underground shows that you knew of them at the time too, in the warehouse thing. And I mean, you don't fake that. So I also, like, every band's like, we should go to LA, we should go to New York. It's not so much anymore, but it used to be a big thing. You're right here, wherever you are, if, you, if it's not working, figure it out where you're from. You know, if you're drawing 20 people, you're, there's, doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing it. It's fun. I, I play shows in front of 20 people. As a matter of fact, I still will play shows in front of 20 people. Well, I've seen you play shows in front of 20 people. <laughs> But I'm very selective about who it. It's my, it's my VIP upgrade. <laughs> At the top tier, it gets very difficult to get in. Um, but if you're drunk, you know, if you want to actually go for it, I mean, you need to constantly be reassessing your shows and the songs and the set list and you know what's working and why are people not showing up. And it's hard to get people to care, like I said, because when we were all starting, it wasn't like 80 billion channels of TV. I could play Call of Duty in 3D. <coughs> Pornhub wasn't even a thing. You know, all the things that would keep you away from doing now is like a billion things. Oh, the form of analog then. I used to get, I used to get fast time. 